Yeah, thank you and thank all of you for coming out tonight. Um, I'd like to say that the significance or prestige of the speakers is directly proportional to the number of people that introduce them. And so, so this is like going to be twice as good as a normal lecture. I, I'm over here and we're going to have them talk here because the, the microphone is here. Not that you need that, but because we're recording this. And for that reason, um, we're going to hold off questions till the end. And that way the speakers can repeat the question or paraphrase them. So all that gets recorded as part of the archive of this great event. Uh, I've known uh, Lauren for a long time. She came here from Gustavus, uh, I bet, <laughs> Gustavus Adolphus, uh, where she got her bachelor's in physics. She came here in a unique program uh, where the Peace Corps service was merged with graduate studies. And that's how I knew her for her graduate studies. And I was on her advisory committee where she served in, in the country Cameroon. Uh, and then she stayed on after her and got a PhD and she mentored some of my students that became Peace Corps volunteers and it, it was really great. Uh, Chris Warren graduated from Michigan Tech as well uh, with his bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 2008. Um, he grew up in Michigan on the near the shores of Saginaw Bay. Uh, he went on got a master's degree in civil engineering from uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, my appreciation for them coming. Uh, and to the appreciation of the Army Corps engineers for letting them come and share this information. Uh, and so as a courtesy, I want to point out the future Army Corps engineer workers. So we have Katie Kring here, who's uh, going to be joining that Detroit office in the spring. And then the Emeritus Corps of Engineers. So my colleague, Dr. Watkins, worked for the Corps engineers. And yours truly worked for the Corps engineers. Um, and so in the summer of 1980, I used to mow the eight foot wide swath of grass that's about a mile long on the outside of the fence at the Sioux Locks. <laughs> and steel toe boots and a hard hat. I'm still not sure why I had to wear a hard hat. And pushing a real mower, you know, the, the real kind. And then I used to pluck the petunias too. Uh, but I've been watching water level changes because I grew up in the Sioux, you know, my whole life. Uh, and some days there, in a matter of 10 minutes, a lake level would change 21 feet, I noticed. But several times a day. Um, and so I think those are going to be different than the changes you guys are going to show, but you're going to show some measurements from there. And so we're really happy for, for you to share that information with us. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, we're really thrilled to be up here being grads. You know, we're happy for any opportunity. So when I got news from John that he was looking for a speaker, I went first thing to my supervisor, and he said, as long as you can book some other talks. So we're going to Marquette, we're making a big road show out of this. So thank you for starting that, and, and we're happy to be here doing some outreach. Um, so, so we're from the Corps of Engineers, uh, and some of you might wonder why we're here talking about not just water levels, but water level forecasting. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District Office, where you'll be pretty soon, I guess, um, one of our missions is to support the, the regulation of outflows through the St. Mary's River, um, and that's through the Lake Superior Board of Patrol. So uh, we, we kind of provide the technical support for the regulation. We don't, we don't do the regulation, but we, we provide the technical support. And so part of that is, is monitoring water levels, tracking things, and providing forecasts to the uh, public and to the International Joint Commission. Um, I'll just mention what's on this picture. Is this the laser? Yeah. So this, this is on Lake Erie. Um, last spring, this is a place called Stony Point on Lake Erie. And uh, just one demonstration of the dramatic effects that we've been seeing on, on water, from water levels around the Great Lakes. So uh, our talk is going to follow a pretty basic outline here. We're going to talk about where, where water levels are now. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we measure them in terms of where the gauges are um, and how we get to our, our official records of, of water levels. I'll talk about how we, how we are now relative to historical levels. So people who grew up on, on the lakes will be familiar with that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what causes water levels to change before handing it over to my colleague Chris to talk about our forecast. 
So where water levels are right now, this is actually last year, so this is a little old news. This is in Duluth. Um, I was up here in Houghton for the State of Lake Superior meeting. I think you were up here too. There, I saw you then, Dave. Um, but we were up here and it was snowing. It seems like every time I come up here, it's snowing, whether it's April, October, <laughs> January. So, so this, this is a storm in Duluth. Uh, caused a lot of damage, millions of dollars worth of damage. And actually not last year, 2018, there was a similar storm last year in October, pretty significant damage. Um, going downstream to Lake Michigan Huron, which we talk about as one lake because they're connected at the streets. Um, so this picture on the left, Oh, let's see. I think I just went to the end. Hit the wrong button. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is Grand Traverse Bay. In 2008, this was kind of during that extended low water period that you guys remember. There was a record low in 2007 on Lake Superior, and then in a record low on Lake Michigan Huron at the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013. Uh, this is just this last May taken by the same person at the same place on Grand Traverse Bay. So that's that's kind of in general the difference that we're talking about from record low. This this picture here is actually not not record high, but a, uh, about five foot difference between those two photos. Um, and that was still water, but when we when we combine uh, those changes that we see with lake lake levels, when we combine it with meteorological conditions that cause waves uh, and erosion action, this is probably some of the news that you guys have been seeing um, from downstate on the, the, west coast, the west coast of Michigan. And also there's some of this happening in, in Wisconsin around the Racine area. So the bluffs are, are eroding and, and people are losing homes. Uh, this is a picture we saw on Lake Erie. So I'm just kind of walking through the Great Lakes. And furthest downstream, this is Lake Ontario last winter. This house fairly close to the water and under normal conditions, you know, there'd be some spray coming. But when water levels are high, that spray is coming a lot closer to the home and it actually covered the home completely in ice. Um, and so, so we have these, these things are happening, whether you're at low water or high water, but when it's happening at high water, the impacts are, are much more felt by people. Okay, so I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the Great Lakes Basin, but I wanna point out a couple things on this slide. So first thing is just the uniqueness of our base. And I know we think of the Great Lakes as being unique, but one of the things from the monitoring and forecasting point of view is that our essentially river basin, it's a river basin uh, going out to the Atlantic, is different in that it's covered by so much fresh water. And that means that we have to be able to account for the processes that are happening over the lakes themselves, like evaporation and precipitation that's falling on the lake. The other thing to point out, which you guys probably are aware of, is that everything falling in this green area, except for, let me draw the line here, everything that's falling above the Lake Ontario Basin, every drop of water is going to impact the water levels on Lake Superior, and that's because it's an interconnected system. So this system that we're showing here from west to east, starting Lake Superior, ending in the Atlantic Ocean. So the, the main point here is that, um, the lake-to-lake the -lake levels have an influence on the flows, especially like especially when we're going from Lake Michigan here on to Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, in terms of the, the drop in water levels, that's gonna impact the amount of flow. That's also influencing what's happening at the St. Mary's River as well. Uh, so in terms of the, the other lakes, they're impacting you, except for what's happening on Lake Ontario. That's because we have Niagara Falls between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So before I go into uh, kind of how we monitor water levels, just a few quick notes so that we're on the same page. When we're talking about water levels, we're not talking about a depth, it's an elevation uh, above sea level. It's actually above the International Great, Great Lakes Datum, which has its outlet very close to sea level. So it's essentially above sea level. Um, lake Michigan Huron is one lake. When, when I'm talking about water levels, almost always I'm going to be talking about monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. Those are the official records that we keep at the Army Corps. And that's because we have a lot of variability on a day-to-day -day basis, so we consider our measurements on the monthly 
average basis to be more accurate. Um, it's based on still water, so these kinds of effects that are causing the havoc that we're seeing in terms of erosion are not necessarily considered in our water level estimates. Um, it's based on a network of gauges, which I'll show in a second, and all water level data can be downloaded from our website at the Detroit District Army Corps of Engineers. All of our records are based on data going back to 1918, and I'll show that data. And I do want to point out that everything that we do to support the International Joint Commission is, uh, is done in coordination with our counterparts in Environment and Climate Change Canada. So the forecast that I printed out and that we put online, that's coordinated with them. We check our numbers with them. We use their data, they use our data. So the gauges that we use to compute lake-wide average water levels are shown here. Uh, lake Superior has four gauges. Um, the four gauges that we use for lake-wide average water levels. These are the ones that look like kind of bullseyes. This is a master gauge in that it's a gauge that has the least influence of um, isostatic rebound. So the green gauges, those are operated by the Canadian Hydrographic Service, and the blue gauges are operated by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So when we're looking at water levels, we're computing from using data from Duluth, Marquette, Point Iroquois, Thunder Bay, and Mishpacotin. Oh, I said four, it's five. Here's Point, Point Iroquois. So we do this on, we, we gather the da data from each gauge, we compute <laughs> daily averages from the gauges, and then with those, we compute a lake-wide average water level, which are shown, we just, we provide the numbers in reports, and we keep track of them on a daily basis, and we compare them to statistics. Our statistics are all based on those monthly values. So the big news in 2019 and, and start of 2020 is that we have a lot of new record high water levels. And these are record high relative to our period of record going back to 1918. So starting in May, Lake Superior hit new record high water levels, May, June, and July. And then in August and September, Lake Superior tied its previous record high water level. Now, that, now in January, again, last month, we, we had a new record high water level. And these records are relative to the water levels for that month of the year. So we're talking about record high water levels, but I want to show just in general how water levels change. Don't panic by all the lines and numbers that you can't see on here. What's really important is just to see the wiggles. So, so whenever I show a graph that's going to have multiple lakes on it, I'll always start with Lake Superior on the top because it's the best, <laughs> also the most upstream, and then downstream to Lake Ontario. It's not the worst, but it's also a great lake. Um, so, so going back to 1918, and this is just last month on this side, uh, so first thing to point out is we just, we see a pretty good amount of variability on a month-to-month -month basis, but also on an interannual basis. Um, the thing that stands out to a lot of people probably in this room, and also if you talk to somebody who lived on Lake Michigan Huron, is this period that uh, really was from about the end of the 1990s to the beginning of the 2010s with extended low water period. And I mentioned that it included a record low on Lake Superior in 2007 and culminated in record high, or record low on, on Lake Michigan Huron at the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013. Okay, so in low water period, we have, um, you know, the, the problems related to low water are pretty different from what we're seeing now. We have access issues. I have a small sailboat with my husband, and we were at a dock like this, and I had to climb the ladder to get out just to go to the bathroom. Um, it's a little different now. Uh, navigation is a, is a problem. You know, there was more dredging in low water period. Vegetation is growing on beaches, which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you're talking to or where it is. Um, and there's a little less hydropower generation. Subsequent to that period of low water, in 2013 and 14, this first green bar that's shown here, that was actually a record-setting two-year rise on Lake Superior and Lake Michigan Huron. And that was caused by, by wetter than average conditions. Uh, there was evidence of a little bit less than average evaporation and increased runoff. Then uh, 2015 and 16 were a, were a little bit more normal. 
That, but in the recent years, we've had really wet conditions again. And here we are, 2019 and 20, with record high water levels really on all of the lakes. And at high water, we have a lot of different issues that are perhaps more impactful to property and infrastructure. So there's uh, shoreline erosion, like what I sh showed you on Lake Michigan Huron, property damage. Uh, I, heard, I think I heard Dr. Rose talking about stage events. Um, so when, when we have meteorological conditions, it may be in a bay where you are, uh, Green Bay is susceptible to stage events. Lake Erie is particularly susceptible because it has the southwest to northeast orientation. So when you get winds that go southwest to northeast, you can have water stacking up. So it's essentially water stacking up on one side of, of a bay. Uh, ice jams cause more damage. Again, these things, are ha these things happen at low water, but we just don't, we don't worry about them at low water. This is Marquette in 2018, I believe, on that Lakeshore Drive. So I'm going to go a little bit more detail into the impacts around the Great Lakes. Just um, you guys are going to recognize this one. <laughs> so um, so each, each of the next few slides is going to have a very similar graphic. So I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. So what you're seeing here is the water levels for the past couple of years. The blue dots, those are showing the lake-wide average, the monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. This black squiggly line is showing the daily values of lake-wide average water levels. These horizontal lines, those are the horizontal dark lines, are the long-term average monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. It's a mouthful, I know. And then the gray lines on the bottom and the top are the record low and record high monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. So remember, I showed this picture earlier, October of 2018, that was the case where we had very widespread precipitation. Uh, it came in the form of rain and snow, and we actually saw a three and a half inch rise. Usually we don't think of single events as causing a substantial rise on the lakes. Uh, in that case, because it was so widespread, it really did. Uh, you guys remember this event quite clearly. What was it, like seven inches of precip over how long? Uh, four hours? It was an extreme amount. You guys were really the bullseye of that event. Uh, so we don't see that kind of um, we don't see that kind of impact as substantially as we see here. But what you did have was increased impacts from flooding because the water had to take time to get out because the water levels were pretty high. Okay, so going downstream to Lake Michigan Huron, um, the things I want to point out on this this graphic that are kind of important for where we are now. Well, we were already at pretty high water levels, um, but then this past year happened and Lake Michigan Huron had a very steep rise in the spring due to a lot of precipitation. Uh, there was actually record amounts of precipitation in, from January to June, and then very little seasonal decline this year. The lake only fell about five inches compared to normal, which is about 12 inches. Uh, so we really didn't see the seasonal decline that we were hoping for. And so Lake Michigan Huron started the year about 17 inches higher than where it was at the same time last year. So this graphic on the right is showing a meteor tsunami event in Ludington. I think it was, yeah, so April 2018. And the meteor tsunami is essentially, a, it's a wave that has the characteristics of a tsunami caused by geological events, but it's caused by meteorology. So it has the same kind of frequency, um, but it's caused by meteorology. These happen really pretty regularly, but we, we don't notice them unless they're doing this. They're covering up a pier in Ludington, and this is that house eroding on Lake Michigan. Okay, so we count Lake St. Clair as a great lake because it's part of our system. It's sort of a blip in the Detroit River, but it's important. And they, they have their own high water impacts uh, in the form of flooding, but also in the form of flooding when there's uh, ice jams. So last winter, when we had a bad winter, this year actually hasn't been so bad for us down there, but last winter, there was a pretty good ice jam. And so what happens is on Lake St. Clair, this is the graphic for Lake St. Clair, the water doesn't come into Lake St. Clair as fast as it would because the ice jam is just upstream of Lake St. Clair. 
So instead, you see flooding in places that are upstream. <laughs> what you, is difficult to see here, but I'll point out, this is a boat, boat um, lift. So this is like a, the boat house and a boat lift. This is the driveway completely covered by ice. So this is the flooding that's, that's being caused by the, the ice jam. Uh, and causing, causing a lot of problems for the people in that neighborhood. So now working our way down again to Lake Erie, they've just been uh, well above average for the past few years and now um, they, they set a, a bunch of new records in 2019. Um, this, this image down here is showing another Seiche event. So this is a Seiche event on Lake Erie that caused enough water so they could be kayaking for the neighborhoods. This is close to Toledo, I believe. Um, and then this is actually an ice flow that happened on the Niagara River. So you, there, you, can, have, you can have wind causing ice to move around, but it's, it's happening right next to the road here. There's a pretty fun YouTube video. Just look up uh, ice flow uh, for Erie Niagara River and this, this guy who's video, videotaping is pretty fun to watch or listen to. Lake Erie or Lake Ontario has had it pretty rough the past few years. In 2017, which isn't even on this, on this graphic here, but in 2017, they had record high levels and pretty severe flooding on the lake. And now again in 2019, they had new record highs, even higher than 2017. So they saw flooding again. This is that ice house I showed earlier. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what caused our water levels to be high and what, how they change in general before I hand it over to Chris to talk about forecasting. So I showed this graphic and one of the first things I pointed out was the wiggles and how we've got these you know, monthly wiggles. So those, that pattern is something that's pretty predictable on the lakes for the most part. We know that we're gonna have lower water levels in the winter months and higher water levels in the summer months. And that's really the result of what's happening on, on the land around the lakes, but also what's happening in the lake themselves. So, so in the winter, we have our precipitation is really coming down as snow like today. Uh, it's accumulating on the surface. We have not a lot of runoff happening. Um, this year has been a little different down by us. We've had more runoff than usual. So it's just kind of normally a pretty, pretty quiet year or quiet time of the year uh, in the winter. Then things warm up and we start to see snow melt. We see increased runoff, uh, increased, uh, increased precipitation as rain. And so the lakes begin to rise in the spring. Um, and then in the summer, it, we start to have a little bit more drought conditions, but what you also have is that the, the sun is, is giving energy to the lake. And so the, the sun is heating the lake, and that's important because then in the fall, we start to see the impact of the evaporation. So I mentioned the need to represent over lake processes in the way that, that maybe other large river basins of the world don't have to. Uh, part of that is because evaporation is really a pretty substantial portion of the water budget on the Great Lakes. And we have an evaporation expert in the room back in the corner and he's hiding. So, <laughs> um, so, so it's, um, if, if you have a warm, you know, if you have a warm summer and warm surface water and then you have cold air coming in like we do today, then you're gonna see a fair amount of evaporation in, in the fall and early winter. So we call those three things together, evaporation, precipitation, and runoff, we call those three things together net basin supply. The net basin supply plus the inflow from the upstream lake minus the outflow from the downstream lake is going to be what you see in terms of change in water levels. So if your net basin supply plus your inflow it is higher than your outflow, water levels go up, vice versa. So, uh, I'm going to show again a, a few graphics like this. So this, this is just the last few years of that graphic, the, the long-term water level graphic that I showed. Those water levels are shown on the bottom panel going from 1997 to 2019. And on the top, I'm showing the net basin supply for Lake Superior. This is in terms of difference from long-term average for the month. So red bars going down are below average, blue bars going up are above average. So the thing that really stands out is this period since 2013. 
the past seven years, we've had above average net basin supply. And some of those years, like 13, 14, uh, 17, and 19, have really been very high compared to average. So that was this graphic for Lake Superior. And now if you just look at it quickly, you can, your eyes can pick out the same detail on Lake Michigan here on. We have the past, we have five out of the past seven years as being very high net basin supply. Lake Erie, six out of the past seven years. And Lake Ontario, five out of the past seven years. We have very high net basin supply. So why do we have net, high net basin supply? 2013 and 14, do you guys remember that year? I know it's always cold and snowy here, but 2013 and 14, we really had particularly cold and snowy years throughout the basin. So on the left, on the left side, um, I'm showing the 2013 data. These are rankings of precipitation on the, on the top panel and, and temperature on the bottom panel for 2013. Green is being high, uh, higher rank precipitation, brown being lower rank precipitation. 2013 was very wet and subsequently 2014 was fairly wet. It was also very cold in 2013. Then again in 2017, 2017 was the second wettest year on record. This is out of 125 years of record. And 2018 was the seventh year wettest year on record. Now in 2019, we had the first wettest year on record. This is for the Great Lakes Basin on the US side. We, we don't have similar rankings compiled uh, for Canada, but it was fairly similar. We had fairly similar conditions. So we really just had an extended period of persistent wet conditions across the Great Lakes Basin. <laughs> now here we are in 2020, and January actually wasn't all that wet. It was a little bit wet, but it was the 23rd wettest, wettest January on record. It was very warm. Um, I don't know that it was particularly warm up here, was it? Was it January? Okay. And down by us, it was very warm in December and January. And so that's what was important. Uh, in terms of in terms of the seasonal decline that we didn't see very very much this year so so sometimes people wonder how how the lack of ice is influencing evaporation or how the warm temperatures are influencing evaporation and the water bubble this i took this image from coast watch uh, it's a satellite image from from february 13th the day before valentine's day we have very little ice on the lake. Uh, it's pretty low. I think we looked, was it 18% today? Uh, was the total for the Great Lakes, 18%. And that's pretty low for this time of year. Um, and so, so a lot of people think, well, okay, we don't have a lot of ice. We're gonna have a ton of evaporation. Well, this day, we kind of did have a lot of evaporation. But what happens is that when, when we have warm conditions, that's actually what, what's more important is the difference between the surface water temperature and the air temperature. So this is an example on the 13th when we actually had cold air, but our surface water is pretty warm. We don't have a lot of ice. So we've got warm surface water, cold air coming in on the 13th. That's kind of when temperatures started going south here. And we had, you could just see the evaporation coming off the lake. Um, the, the reverse is to when, when you have warm air and you know, the surface water is relatively warm. You just don't have a lot of, um, you just don't have a lot of gradient between the surface water and the air temperature. Think of a, a glass of cold water on a hot day. What happens? You have condensation, right? So it's actually more complex than just thinking of the ice as a cap on evaporation. In addition to that, we had a lot of runoff. These two maps are showing the December on the left in January runoff compiled by the USGS. Um, so blacks are very high runoff, or high runoff is the definition. Blue is much above normal, green is normal. And so December we had pretty high runoff around uh, much of the Lake Michigan Basin. And in January we had particularly high runoff. So when we have warm conditions, more of the precipitation throughout the basin is coming as rainfall and there's more runoff going to the lake. So those two things combined are really evident in our, in our graphic on Lake Michigan here on when we had this pretty low seasonal decline on that lake. 
So now I'm going to hand it over to Chris to talk about forecasting, and then we'll come back and you can answer questions. I, I should mention any information on here is going to be on the websites that are on that handout, and my contact information is on the handout in the back of the room. So you can get a hold of me then. So, so what I think Lauren failed to mention she is she's actually our technical lead for Great Lakes Water Levels Forecasting in the Detroit District. So. That question, she is the expert teacher. So uh, she, she walked you through kind of what's going on, what's driving things, what we've seen recently. I'll talk about what's coming up. So we'll start close by. Uh, on the top left there, we have what I call a QPS. So it essentially gives us a quantitative, sort of the amount of rainfall or precipitation in the next seven days. Uh, the good news is uh, what, when we had really originally sent John the slides, you know, we were seeing these you know, darker blues and reds um, in this area. That's lightened up. So now we're seeing greens here. So that's a, less than about half of an inch of water over the next seven days. You know, that'll show up, likely show up as snow. So it, it won't be half an inch of snow, it'll be more. Moving forward, uh, what we're also looking at, you know, the Climate Prediction Center, that, that's a group in, inside of NOAA, and information they're giving us. Well, I'll explain <laughs> these graphics a little bit. <laughs> Let's uh, start at the top right, actually, which is the February outlook. Uh, it was put together on the 31st of January. There's really, it's a, it's a three-phase probability. So where do you see these green areas? So, you know, Montana, Florida, Georgia, those areas. That's an area where they're saying there's an increased chance of above-average precipitation. The uh, brownish, orangish areas, you know, California, you know, they're always screaming for water. Th th those are areas where there's an increased chance of below-average precipitation. And uh, much to my supervisor's chagrin, you know, the white, you know, he's a meteorologist, that's equal chances. You know, I, I joke that they throw up their hands and say we don't know. <laughs> so what we're looking at, 8 to 14 day range, so really the end of February, right? Um, you know, looking, again, increased chances of above average precipitation for our region. You know, I, you, know, you, you might notice that Canada appears to be always be equal chances. That's because you know, it's one of the challenges of working on an international boundary. You know, they, they, we just don't have the data on the other side there. Um, and then what, once we get, you know, okay, well, how, how does the end of February look wet and all of February look relatively dry or equal chances? We're, we're currently at about 50% of the precipitation we would expect to see for February across the whole Great Lakes Basin. Lake Superior is just a little bit behind that. So even a wet end to this month doesn't necessarily put us above average for the month of February. Going a little further, this, these are a little harder to see, but I, I think you can still find home here. So on the left, we have March, April, May, you know, and then it jumps a month, April, May, June in the middle, May, June, July in the far right. The top is temperature. So that's similar to the precipitation uh, where white is equal chances of above or below average temperature. For us, you know, really looking at equal chances, equal chances, and then finally in the May, June, July time frame, there's a little bit of a warm signal creeping in. That's not, not something that I put a whole lot of confidence in that far out. You know, it's a ways out. The bad news is on the bottom where there's a pretty strong wet signal really through you know, the, the July timeframe. And um, you know, that, that's something we will look at and when we're forecasting, we actually incorporate some of this information into that process. Hey, don't worry, we will talk about this. <laughs> so th this, this is a whole bunch of squiggles and lines really close together. It's actually a screenshot of our monthly forecast. This is a product available on our website. We actually mail it out. My wife teases me that I get a copy mailed to my house, but I, I kind of like it. So what, what it is, is it forecasts the next six months of monthly mean water levels. So we'll step through this here in just a moment, but I want to take a moment to say, you know, that this is done at the beginning of each, every, every month. You know, if you're in a position where you really would like to know what's going on in the six months, th this, is, this is what we're looking at in our office. All right, so let, this is a blown up version of the Lake Superior um, forecast. So I think it's just it's the top one again. Like Lauren said, we start, start at the upstream end, we go to the downstream. The blue dashed line is the monthly mean long term average. So every month you know, going back to 1918 has an average. That's what the blue line is. You see it's a nice repeating pattern. The red solid line is the last two years. So we've seen something similar in the plots Lawrence presented. 
And then it's a little hard to see, but these dashes, and then on top of the dashes is actually a year. Those are the monthly mean maximum and minimum that we've seen for that month in the associated year. Um, all of these are on the handouts that for those of you who are here in the room, those are, it's on there. And let's see, the green line's a little faint there. So, so that's our forecast over the next six months. That's what we're expecting to see. And then there's kind of a, a red shaded cone around that. And that gets a little larger as you move out towards the summer months. That's really kind of how we encapsulate the uncertainty in our forecast. You know, we, we don't, you know, I, I sure wish we could predict that line perfectly, but we, we know we can't with the naturally variable system. Uh, I think that's, you know, there, there's this wonderfully long link here on the bottom. You know, we, the easiest way to find this is our website has a high water levels web page with a big red banner right at the top. So if you have the Army Corps of Engineers, high water levels into Google, it'll show up pretty quickly. All right, so let's talk about that forecast a little bit. Uh, currently, we're in a period of seasonal decline. We expect that to continue into March. And then going over the next six months, we're going to be like right at or just a couple inches below record monthly highs as a mean. I, I don't like to bring this up, but we probably should. Uh, the January level was four inches above last year's January level. The, the reason I don't like to bring that up, you know, for folks being impacted by high water is that if you're already at high water on the Great Lakes, high water is likely to continue for a while. It's not, not, uh, not a great, great news all the time. Um, you know, we, Lauren already pointed these out, so we'll be brief about it. Uh, May, June, July, we set monthly mean records on you know, Lake Superior. We tied them in August and September, and then we set another one back here in January. So it's, it, it has been wet and will continue to be that way. Let's, uh, yeah, Lake Michigan Heron. I think Lake Michigan Heron felt left out last year. You know, it didn't hit a record, and all, all the other lakes did. But again, here in January, it hit a new record high. That one was 17 inches above the water level record, or water level. And we're expecting record highs on Lake Michigan Huron for the next six months, uh, anywhere from four to seven inches. So yeah, that, that's a lot of water. You know, we're not expecting any further seasonal decline. You, you can see it kind of it kind of flatlined there at the, at the end of the month. We're, we're expecting to start to see that going up as we move into warmer temperatures in the spring months here. All right. So this is Lake Erie. No. I wanted to go to St. Clair, but I guess we skipped it this time. Uh, so uh, Lake Erie is already in its period of seasonal rise. We're expecting to see that until May. Uh, it's starting, you know, pretty high. Uh, we're forecasting records five inches above the record high, and we're not expecting as large of a seasonal rise. So by the time we get out to June and July, we expect to be about four inches below. So it, it's not as large of a rise, but we're still very, very high. And the, uh, you know, again, January level was higher than it was last year by about seven inches. All right, Lake Ontario. So again, uh, a little further south, already in the period of seasonal rise. And you can see those you know, June, July uh, record highs. You know, the one in July was the highest and it was in the period of record, you know, going back to 1918. We are not expecting that one to break any records here in the next six months, although it will still be 13 to 23 inches above and continuing the story, it's, the level is higher than it was in January. So this is a little different um, in terms of the information that's presented. Yeah, we'll get into details again on it. This is our water level outlook tool. This is something we developed really in response to the like, well, what if this happens? Or how do, what, what if we see another year like last year? So this is not a forecast. What, what this is is the tool that you value what happens under a certain scenario. So the, it's really scenario driven. It's based on historical supplies. So we take those net basin supply sequences, the precipitation, the evaporation and runoff, and we feed it through the routing models that balances the water levels and flows in all the lakes. And then it kind of gives us what we're looking at here. So we'll zoom in on Lake Superior. This is a lot easier to see. Again, here's that nice regular pattern. That's our long-term average monthly means. You got these little tiny dashes on the bottom and the top. Those are our maximum and minimum uh, monthly means that we've observed. The black 
wine is what we've seen the last two years. And because we're not so constrained by uncertainty, we get to take this one out a full year and kind of look at what, what's happening. So the gray cloud or band here is really kind of the full range of what we would expect based on what we've already seen. So if we have that supply sequence in our history, we run it through and you know, we, you know, put a line here somewhere. Let's see. So green is what happens if we got last year again. And then Lauren will correct me here. I'm pretty sure purple is 1997. Um, an, okay, blue is 96 and then purple is 2017. So blue and green. So those are two wet years. And then 2017 is a bit more of a normal year in terms of water supplies. Well, you know, what, what I find pretty fascinating about this is even under a normal year, we're a long ways from long-term normal water levels. You know, it, you're, if you look, look at the scale here on the right, you know, by, by the end of it, you're 601.5, oh, you're still 603, you're still 18 inches above average, even on kind of a normal one. You know, it, it would take extremely dry conditions, you know, pre, pretty dramatic stuff with a lot of impacts outside of water levels to even get us to approach our long-term average here. You know, along with our monthly bulletin, our six-month forecast, this comes out at you know, the beginning of the month here in February. So is there anything else? I think that's about it for this one. We, we like this product. We, we sit around and say, oh, what if this happened again? What if that happened again? You know, so, oh, what if we don't get any EVAP? We find, find a year where that happens and we'll run it through. So I, I heard a few folks talking in the crowd before we started about, you know, their property on the coastline. Uh, th this is a document that we put together a few years ago uh, with Noah Seagrant. The document's a little old, so the contact information is definitely outdated. However, um, our engineers have given it the green light and thumbs up as far as living on the coast, coastal processes, how do you control erosion on your property, what's going on with the waves and those kind of things. You know, how, how do you actually protect your home? starting at the top, going all the way down to the shoreline, some of those kind of questions. It really, it's, it's a good resource for property owners. I have one sitting at my desk. I thumb through it occasionally at lunch. And then emergency response. So being a federal agency, we get this question a lot. You know, what can the Corps do for me? I've got a home that's going to fall in. Our support really supplements local and state level emergency actions. And the other key piece there is our work is directed at protecting public infrastructure, so not private homes. So FEMA is the agency that's able to provide private assistance. We, we are not. If you have questions in emergency response, I'd be happy to get you to one of our people who actually is far more competent at that than I am. I am a water resources engineer. Emergency response is not my forte by a long shot, but I wanted to make sure this was in here. So if anybody did have questions, I'd give you a chance to, hey, I need to talk to him. We'll, we'll get you connected. All right. So questions, contact information. Um, you know, if, if you want, take a picture of this. You know, there's Pat Cooney, our chief of emergency management. He's, he's a guy to be referring to for that. Um, if you have questions on regulations, since the Corps of Engineers is the regulatory, regulatory authority for the Great Lakes, you can give our regulatory department a call, or uh, you can talk to Lauren or myself. Uh, we're up there if it's just Great Lakes water levels. And then uh, we also have an outreach coordinator. His name is Jim Luke. You know, if, if you're really interested in programs, you're like, hey, you know, I'm public works director, and you know, I'm interested in like getting together for a study to like solve a problem. <laughs> you know, you can work. So that just about wraps up what we have in the can speech. But we're looking forward to talking to you guys. So we'll, we'll start with questions. And gentlemen, right there. Um, I want to push you a little bit. I mean, I appreciate since I'm an old guy. I appreciate the, the fact that you have a short-term forecast for a few years in the future, but I'm interested mm -hmm. in what my grandchildren might feel. And so I want to ask you a couple of questions about what controls this. And just my initial reaction, I look at it, it doesn't look like the curves you show have a direct connection with global warming. It also, maybe because you have this 
low period and then a sudden upswing in the last few years. That's not a feature of any global warming curve that I've seen. But one thing that occurs to me is the Pacific Ocean temperature, uh, El Nino uh, trends, because the Pacific Ocean is warmer and other sort of oscillation. So are there long-term causes on Earth that you consider could be partly driving what we're seeing here, or is there discussion about them? Well, what should we think about? So I, I, I'll start, and then I'm sure Lauren will chime in too. Um, let, let me make sure I've got your questions captured, and then if there's anybody listening, we'll be able to hear it too. So your questions are, you know, are, are we looking at global warming, those influences in our forecast? Is that correct? Like, yep. And then, you know, what drivers or what things could be, you know, influencing that? But, but was that all of it? You got it? That's good enough. Good, good enough start? Okay. Um, so the answer is we look at what's going on from the Climate Prediction Center. And it's a six-month forecast, right? That gets rolled into our forecasting process. Uh, however, <laughs> climate attribution at this scale is pretty hard. So being able to tease out, here's how the climate changed and here's how that's impacted our water levels is pretty hard to do. Let me see if I can back up. And when you're talking climate scales, right, we talk epics, right? Like, so it's you know, long, long time periods. Oh, and we, we We've got a few of those time periods included, and you see some longer term periods in a record, right? Teasing out what the climate driver was that caused that is not something that there's going to be been a lot of. Um, Lauren and I have talked a little bit about, you know, there's still, there's still research going on, particularly at the Great Lakes kind of scale. We do, you know, our, our climatologist, meteorologist in our office sends out regular Pacific Ocean <laughs> temperature updates, and you know, we're looking at those, what they call teleconnections, right? You know, how does a butterfly flap its wings and cause a hurricane somewhere? So we, we, we look at those kind of things and try to incorporate the information. I, I think I, I kind of got to your question, but you, are you satisfied with that one? Well, I didn't expect to be satisfied. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love to jump in. Yeah, for little. sure. Like, because yeah. we actually get that question a lot, and I really want to have a better answer. So I'd love to have people like you guys help us out with the answer. Um, I, you guys probably remember at the end of, like, in the 2013 time frame, uh, I think climate modelers were telling us, uh, or models were telling us that we would see potential for continued low water. Uh, we had kind of we felt like this is a new regime we're in, we're stuck with low water. Um, I think there's been more research showing we're less certain about what's happening. Uh, both to like the degree of that decline, but also potential for high water. I think the conversation is shifting a little bit for changes in the frequency of change, uh, change from low to high and vice versa. Definitely that being, having the need to prepare for both high and low water levels. But I think that, I think that we need to have more, more research just like in the attribution, but also long-term, you know, the Cato scale climate modeling and impacts on the Great Lakes. So um, people like Felipe and, and Dave and you, you can, have, you know, it's, it's good to, to have that conversation. I think we need to keep that conversation going forward. Obviously it's a little, you know, we, we out, uh, out in the world, people get, get uh, mixed up between the rise in, in ocean levels and what we're seeing on the Great Lakes. Um, it's a little bit different here on the Great Lakes because we have to consider evaporation and runoff into the Great Lakes and how the flows are changing because of the changing lake levels and all that. So it's not just like a, a monotonic trend or a single direction trend. So yeah, I think it's an area we need more, more effort placed into to have a better answer on that. So the gentleman right here really uh, it jumped up. Dynamic. I only see one other period on there where you have that rate of change. Uh, you know, in early, early, early part of your graph, you have a drop in there. It must have been a drought or something. Eh? 
And then when they're, all the lakes are rising on the other end, it's a, a very short period of time of rise. But anyway, uh, based on your net basin supply mm -hmm. data, are you having the same problems on in the streams and lakes all over the Great Lakes Basin? Yeah, so I, I could probably answer that on uh, a microcosm. So I, I'm the lead engineer for our only reservoir or lake we manage in the Detroit district. That's Lake Winnebago, it's 200 square miles in Wisconsin. Um, we are at the point there where, you know, it, it's the wettest Wisconsin has seen in the wettest one, two, three, four, and five year periods going back over 120 years. So yeah, we're, we're seeing those kind of supplies and we're seeing impacts, you know, not, not just, you know, how do we manage the water? You know, we're actively drawing the water level down right now. We're, we're going further because we expect those supplies to be higher. But I mean, e even the soil, right? And the, the soil in some places there is literally, groundwater is literally feet higher than it is in a normal basis. You know, it, we showed that plot, you know, the stream flows and they do a similar one for groundwater. And like, you know, the three gauges we watch in that basin are all well above the 90th percentile. So yeah, we're, we're seeing that locally as well, for sure. One, one follow-up on that. Do you guys monitor relative humidity of the lakes on your sensors? Uh, we don't, but that would be something that would be like on the buoys that Noah has out. Um, okay, you've been we're super excited. <laughs> and I'm totally not a scientist, but I am very interested because I've lived here up and on since 1974, and a lot of people have told me if the Sulaks are holding the lake water in, you haven't mentioned the Sulaks at all. Is that code? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah, we'll the grew up there talking about it, right? <laughs> but as a, as a cause of why the security is so high. Yeah, it, it's really easy to point to the Sulaks as a cause, um, just because they're large, there's a lot of water coming through them, right? But the reality is that the impact of the locks and the regulation is a very small impact on the water levels of the Great Lakes. That's a lot of water leaving that lake, right? Right there, you know, and that's just one day, right? So it, it's you know the, the scale. I mean, you can almost see the locks in that picture, uh, but so so yeah, the the, the scale of the Sioux locks is much much smaller than the Lake Superior Basin as a whole. So they're not holding it in to protect downstate property. Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> no. In, in fact, the folks in Chicago would love it if we could, but no. I'm not. Yeah. So the the locks the. Not the locks, but the the flow through the St. Mary's River is yeah. is regulated, so so we can regulate flow, but humans have limited ability to actually regulate the water levels because of the force of of Mother Nature and the size of the basins that we're dealing with. Um, oh, so you were asking about uh, down regulation for downstream lakes. So 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 the flow is regulated according to Plan Twenty Twelve. Um, and that, that plan starts by, by trying to, by figuring out what a pre-project condition would be. And so that would be a, the flow without the existing infrastructure, what the pre-project condition would be. And then balancing, balancing the impacts upstream and downstream. And then finally, uh, looking at the, the physical limits of the, the channels and the hydropower. And then allocating flow really just between like, Hydropower and how much how much the rapids can can take, um, and so so there is some degree like they try to they try to do some regulation, but the amount that the amount that the regulation can impact the water levels on the lakes is small. Thank you. There's a talk about what can you do to protect your house on the lake. I noticed in the picture of the house at the base of the dune that had fallen down. Somebody had already put a whole bunch of rock on that shoreline. What can you do? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, move. Well, it, I mean, so the house moving industry, like people literally pick the house up and move it back. Um, that, that living on the coast book talks about some of those processes. Like you can move your house, not cheap. Probably the most effective way to buy yourself time because the bluffs don't come back, right? Unless they're gone now. And uh, you know, it, you know, Warren pointed out that those erosion processes are happening really up to about, you know, they're happening all the time. They're happening to about 30 feet of water depth. 
So when the water level is low, you're eroding this toe of that slope that extends out into the lake. And when the water, water level comes up, now it's pounding on this slope, but the slope's been destabilized by removing the bottom end during low water. So the really low eroding for a long period of time, really high beating on the top of it has been taking a lot there. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty dramatic shift in the last few years. And um, yeah, I, I think the most effective thing I've seen is moving your house. You know, this isn't the kind of stuff where you can put it on stilts, right? Like down on the Mississippi River, you got you to be a little more creative. And I would reiterate, he mentioned the living on the coast booklet. So we're not coastal engineers, you know, we don't do design the revetment kind of things that you would do to, to protect your house. But that booklet has a lot of useful information with really good graphics on things, things that you can do, um, what to look for mm -hmm. when you're uh, trying to find a contractor to do this. Um, it doesn't provide contractors, but. Is that on your website? Yeah, it's on our website. And um, if I know the URLs are terrible, so there's a handout back there that has URLs that will let you so you don't have to write yep. them down here. Sir? Do you folks lump condensation in with evaporation as a net evaporation? When you say evaporation, are you. Just, you yeah, and condensation is really a small a very small fraction compared to the evaporation. You see some condensation in like the June time frame, you know, when you have cold water and warm air. Um, but really we're just, it, the evaporation is, is what's coming with the net out, out from the lake. And so we, we can have negative evaporation and that's condensation. Sure. Cause you should have that any time the lake is below the dew point of the and the air above it. Yeah, we see we see evaporation most in June when you have when you have the cool air or the cool cool lake and the warm air and you have compensation. No, we gotta repeat the questions so people can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was whether or not we, we account for net evaporation so condensation as part of that. So, so John right there, yes sir. You talk about regulating a little bit with the St. Clair River. I'm assuming you were talking about the International Coast Commission. Could you tell us who these folks are and what it's all about? Um, and also you mentioned balancing impacts. And I'd love for you to make that real concrete and specific. Like what are they balancing? What kind of impact? I will try. I won't be able to answer it as well as somebody, for example, from the International Joint Commission as far as like what impacts the question was um, to, t to tell us, tell you a little bit more about regulation, uh, exactly how, like who's doing that, um, what, what the IJC looks like, um, and then, then a little bit more detail about the regulation plan in terms of balancing impacts. Um, I'll start by saying in terms of balancing impacts, I'm not very clear on the details of that because it, that's more on the side of the regulation side of things. Um, but we can put you in touch with the, one of our technical leads on helping with the regulation if you'd like. Um, so as far as the International Joint Commission, it's composed of commissioners from the United States and Canada. They're appointed commissioners. We have all of our US commissioners are in place. Um, and so they are the governing body in terms of regulating the outflows. The, the Corps of Engineers works with Environment and Climate Change Canada to kind of run the models and provide technical support, write reports and stuff to, to, to send up to the IJC, but they're actually making the decision on that. 